Welcome to the Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share that passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with a Latina perspective. Welcome to season 10, where I'm talking with Latinas who have founded nonprofits. I'm so excited to share these powerful conversations. So vamonos, and let's get into it. Rita is a passionate somatic and trauma therapist, freelance educator, public speaker, and storyteller. She is also a group facilitator, community builder, agent of change, and a happy aunt. She loves her work and is thrilled to be part of the global community that strives to bring an effective blend of experience, expertise, clarity, concern, and action to the counseling and educational process in order to maximize outcomes and provide genuine healing and wholeness to children, young adults, adults, couples, and families. One of her goals is to do what she can in her professional and personal life to honor her mother and grandmother and to honor her Black and Inca ancestors by intentionally including and acknowledging the importance of understanding and respecting different cultures. She says, I stand by identifying, increasing, and acknowledging resources that every culture brings to the table. Please enjoy our conversation. Hi, I'm excited to introduce my next guest, and I am so thankful because you were a sponsor for the recent Latina Brilliance event, and it was just so moving and exciting to hear you share about the work that you're doing and the things that you're passionate about and every, all the sponsors were sharing. And so I am so grateful to have you on the podcast this season, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you. It was actually pretty cool to be there and actually very, very happy to be here today. Um, so my name is Rita Romero and actually my, I'm going to say my full name, Julia Rita Romero Oscanoa. Okay. So um, let me just introduce myself, how my mama would introduce me. I am half um, Inca and half black and, um, and yeah, I, I have, I am a happy aunt. And I love what I do. I love the work that I do. It's not not only a job, but it's a career. And I love just people, just spending time with people and trying to figure out how we can come together. That's part of who I am. Mm, and I love hearing your story. I'd love for you to share your journey with the listeners, starting from as as far far back as you want to start. Oh, thanks. Well, I got to tell you, I got to share with you this story because this is kind of like the key story for me. Um, don't know if I ever share it with you, but this is how kind of like the, the snowball started. I was born and raised in Peru. I was there until I was 22. And I remember clearly when I was nine years old, I was with my mom at the bus. Um, we lived in a very um, in a very poor part of Lima, Peru. And we're taking the bus going back home. She was taking me back from the hospital. And then the bus stops at a, at a red light and it stops at the red light. I turn around and I see this little girl. She was a little bit younger than me. I was, I'm going to say maybe not even nine. I was seven. And the little girl might have been maybe four or five years old. So I turn around and there is this little girl with her mom. And as soon as the light turns red, they come running and they start selling candies through the window, right? To the cars. And the first question that came to me and my mind, my mom reminds me of this story too, because I look at my mom and I said, why isn't she in the school? She should be in the school now. And I remember my mom's answer. My mom said, looked at me and she says, because you're going to make her go to school when the time comes. I remember that very clearly, very vivid. Um, fast forward, I am 19, maybe close to 20 years old, taking bus that takes me to my town. And the bus stops, red light, and I'm sitting there by the window. And then I looked outside, I look out, and I see this little girl now, a teenager already, and she was wearing a lot of makeup, and she was wearing these very short shorts, very tight shorts. And then it was not the mom who was running to sell the candies anymore. It was her, and only 14, maybe even 13, selling that. When I saw that, it just crushed my heart crushed my heart because I've just seen her. To me, it was kind of like a snapshot. I've seen her when she was three or four and then seeing her there doing the same thing. You know, there is beauty in that and everything. But in my mind, I kept saying, you know, she has the right to an education. She has the right to have opportunities. She has the right to 
achieve whatever she wants to achieve. And this, this fire started in me on what can I do or how do I play? What's my role into this in a bigger context, not only with her, but in a bigger context. And that's how it started, the, the craziness and the beauty of this journey. Um, knowing where I come from, not forgetting where I come from, not forgetting what it feels to not know if you're gonna eat the next day or not. And to, to know that education is such a key thing to be able to challenge people, to be able to take your family out of poverty, to be able to change systems. That was actually what kind of started that. Mm, that's such a touching story and a powerful one that really influenced the trajectory of your whole life. So from that moment that you saw that little girl and then saw her again as a teenager, how has that impacted your move to the U.S. and what you decided to focus your studies on? Hugely. I decided, I didn't have a real concept, but still a concrete concept, but I, at that moment I decided how important is education and also how I wanted to change uh, generational patterns in my own family. And one of the generational patterns was educational level and also, and also financial legacies. And for that, you know, you gotta, you gotta, one, one person has to start, maybe more than one, but at least one person has to start. So that the legacies, uh, the negative ones, because there's a lot of beauty, a lot of beauty, but the negative ones are the ones that, hold, that uh, keep uh, bringing a lot of pain can change, right? So I decided to apply for this program. I came here and opportunities started to happen right away. I came at a time where um, the human services, you know, non-for-profits were having only um, not too many people who, are, who were bilingual, to be honest. And I didn't know that was that, I would, that was kind of like a key time because I remember when I was taking one of my classes, one of my teachers kind of, I don't know what she saw in me, but she immediately grabbed me. It was at one of my first few classes and she grabbed me and she said, would you be interested in volunteering in this shelter? There is a domestic violence shelter very close by and they don't have any bilingual stuff. And they're seeing a few women coming in who mostly speak Spanish or only speak Spanish. I was very like, what's going on here? But I decided to go. She, I, of course, I accepted that. And when I went there, um, this, there were a few women who were speaking Spanish. And when I looked around, there was nobody in the staff within the staff who spoke Spanish. So that was my entrance. And I really, I do believe that my, that professor knew what she was doing. <laughs> she was, she was creating the path. Because then as, as I started volunteering, I started to question and ask and see more, see, see, uh, see how the systems were trying to do their best, but also how the systems were also very uh, cutting them short and not providing them what they needed, had conversations with a professor. And that was kind of a path being very intentional in meeting people who could actually expand whatever concept was coming in my head to expand it and to be able to give me ideas on how to grow that. Yeah, I think I love that it starts out with that one spark, that one connection that really can make a huge impact on how you get connected and how you start developing your trajectory in, in business and in your education. So when was it that you decided to um, start your business and start the nonprofit. How has that journey developed? So I worked for different non-for-profits for a while, right? And during my work with non-for-profits, I had I made a decision to educate myself as much as I could because I knew the non-for-profits at that time were not going to pay for any extra extra trainings or education. So I spent a lot of the time training myself in different approaches, completing masters, um, things like that to get ready for that moment, right? And then when the time came, the time came to be honest with you out of, this is what I wanna do. And I knew what I, I knew that, that for a long time, meaning having my own business. And it also came out of exhaustion and frustration from how non-for-profits were being run. And you try to, um, I'm not saying all non-for-profits, but my experience with a few that I work with um, or work for, it, I got frustrated. I got frustrated with the system and I got frustrated with one trying to 
change or implement new things in the system and not being able to get anywhere. And I also, the, one of the main things, I wanted to create a space for me and a space that felt authentic for me and a space that felt authentic for people like me, right? And uh, so those three pieces like that, having my own, being able to be more independent, also creating an authentic, uh, an authentic, a safe space for me and out of exhaustion, to be honest, uh, just exhausted of trying to fight with a system that wouldn't change. I like that you mentioned the system that isn't necessarily um, for people like us with our, our lived experiences. And it is frustrating. It is hard to navigate spaces like that. So how have your lived experiences influenced how you lead your nonprofit now? I think back and there, is, there are a lot of nonprofits out there, but they are predominantly led by white white individuals that don't necessarily have the understanding or cultural awareness like they have such great hearts and they might want to like help and pour into communities but unless you have that cultural understanding and cultural lens to um, come at a situation empathetically and even just like the language around when you're serving and helping the people that you're in community with is so important. And so how have your experiences and your feelings in those spaces influenced how you run your business and your nonprofit now? Yeah, thanks for mentioning that because there are two things, right? I have my business, which, which is a for-profit. It's Cardenas Institute, and I have a non-for-profit, which is uh, for equal opportunities, right? And they are both intertwined, yet they are different, right? So the way that when it comes to the non-for-profit, the way that I, the, my, my mantra has always been or was before I actually filed the paperwork is, I always repeat to this to myself, good intentions can cause more harm because good intentions are not enough, Right. And we see that a lot with people who say, I want to help, I want to support, but yet they don't take the time to step back and get the knowledge or step back and be humble or step back and say, am I listening or am I just hearing what I want to hear? Right? So my mantra has always been good intentions can be, can be more damaging. And it's been my mantra because I've seen it being done in my own country. Right. When we come, when we talk about, and I don't want to say that everybody, every missionary does that. But the few experiences that the few people that I have seen going into, into missions there, great intentions, good intentions, but the knowledge of the culture, the knowledge of we want to, we, we just want to, um, you know, move forward or develop or just increase our skills. It's not there. It's just, let me just do it for you. And my mentality is like that. My mentality has always been, uh, what do you want to do? And let's try to figure it out if we can do it together. <laughs> Right. So the, the non for profit comes out of that. Like, what do you want to do? Uh, we are in the non for profit. We are concentrating in this space that is called is this community is called Cerro Camote. And it's a community where I would say 95 percent of the people who live there are street vendors. So they are in severe poverty. And the reason why we chose that community is because there was a connection there. I already know a few people who had been street vendors there. And honestly, my mom at some point years ago was a street vendor in that community there when we were trying to survive. So there is also a connection there, right? And when I tried, when I presented that, the first thing that I asked the people that I know from that, I said, you know, let's, let's talk about what you want. What do you, what do you see that, what, how do you see the need here, right? Um, it started with just that conversation. And one of the things that came up was, hey, there's a lot of needs for food because the, the little money that we make by selling things in the street, sometimes it's not even enough to pay for electricity or water. So what we did is we started by doing like a, a big um, Mother's Day event where people would sign up for that event. Whoever, you know, we, we identify at least 20 families and we provided them food for at least five months. That, that idea came out of them, but also that idea came out because we wanted to develop a relationship and it also was very thought through because 
the 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 connection that uh, people make when somebody gives them food, at least in my country, is if you give me food, it's because you're going to ask me to vote for somebody, or it's because you're going to ask me to do something within the community to elevate a certain politician. So I wanted to start by providing them something that they ask for and actually try to find that connection that has been instilled there for generations. I remember when I was growing up there, I remember actually my my mom, like people knocking on the door and saying, hey, we will give you a, a sack of rice or a bag of rice and will you vote for this candidate, right? And uh, my mom would never accept any of that. My mom would never accept any of that. But I saw the power of doing that and hu- and just taking advantage of the poverty, right? So I wanted to challenge that connection. And this is what we did. So people were very, very, very skeptical at the beginning. Like they would come to pick up the food. We would, they would, our volunteers would engage them in conversations. How are you doing? Hey, would you like a glass of water? There is a space for you to sit here. Tell me about you. And the first few events that we had, this was the question that would come up a lot. So who are you going to ask me to vote for? To vote for? And we would always repeat the same message. We don't want anything. We do not want anything. We just want to get to know you. That's all. So that the this event has grown. And now even we've seen the results as we, as we look back and as we see how it, the conversation or the narrative has changed when they come, that question is not asked anymore. We just talk about how their week is, how their week is or how much they've sold on the streets or what do they sell? How are the kids doing in school and things like that? So it's a beautiful, it's such a powerful way to change the narrative of something that it should be given to people up for dignity, not because you want to take advantage of them, right? So that's that's also kind of my mantra when it comes to the for-profit, which Cardenas Institute actually uh, gives um supports a lot of those expenses to for equal opportunities and this is why also it's so connected for me they are both dearly connected so with Cardenas institute it was the same thing like how do i how do i acknowledge the fact that i live in between two worlds i am living right now in a very western environment yet i come from a non-western perspective right and i want to validate the fact that i've been living here for so many years and i do have some western tendencies that i have to acknowledge yeah, at the same time, the non-Western part is very dearly ingrained in my heart. I believe in the love that it comes from it and in the value of the culture that comes from it. How do I how do I try to merge those so people can come to it's gonna sound like a like a corny thing to say, but how how do I merge both of them so we can come together and wrestle with the differences but not walk away from it? Right? So the way I see or the measurable way I see that it's working, not going good so far, is that we have such a diversity of clients, right? We have clients from all ethnicities, from all parts of the world, because they all find something that they can connect with, whether it's a Western or non Western thing, or maybe both, right? So my goal is with Cardenas at the beginning was, when I was forming Cardenas at the beginning was, okay, I got to do it fully non-Western, right? But it has changed with time. And it's like, I want to honor that on Western and I want to elevate it. And I want people to know that it's there. Yet we got to come together and wrestle with it, even if it causes discomfort. I gave you a long answer, but I hope. (laughs) I really appreciate the stories that you shared and the intention that it has influenced you moving forward and building your businesses. I appreciate your vulnerability in sharing like how you developed as a nonprofit founder. And it just goes to show, like we said before, how important it is to understand the people that you are wanting to serve and wanting to help and understanding the cultural nuances of that community Um, because a lot of times like we want to help like we want to be there we want to give but if we're not understanding that cultural piece of it we could do more harm and we could um, really just kind of like be serving for our own good 
And that is not the reason that we should be serving in the first place. Um, so how do you navigate running a nonprofit over the borders? Like, I know you live here and I know that there is some travel piece that, that you have to do when you are running a nonprofit um, in a different country, but how do you navigate uh, leading your team and partnering with the people here and there to make it all run successfully? <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting because a lot of uh, nothing, no, re no relationship is perfect, right? But we look for progress, not perfection. So it's a lot of conversation, intentional conversations. Like here, for, for example, with the people that we work here, we meet at least once a month. And we think about or we look at where we are, where we were, and where we want to be. And with the people in Peru, we have a very solid group of volunteers. Right now, currently, there are four. And for the four, there is one who leads that group. So I meet with the four, and usually some, more often with the one who leads that group. And we're constantly in communication, either when they need something, you know, WhatsApp is a great way to communicate. So we do a lot of communication there. That's that's a great piece. The other piece that of the other piece that I do is um, we just um, we just gave our first scholarship. Couldn't find a better word for gave, but we granted our first scholarship. There you go. And what this means is we identified uh, a young a young man in the community that is going through his last year of high school. And um, he, um, what we did is saying, and I'm going to give his name out, just be very general out of respect. But what I did is I met with him via video and we asked, I asked him, you know, talk about the organization. And then I asked him, I know you've been having difficulties in school, you know, when it comes to payments and things like that. So I would love to ask you, what does it mean for you to finish school with dignity? What, what would it look like for you, right? And he kind of got puzzled because he didn't know how, I don't think he didn't know, knew how to answer at the beginning, but he paused. I said, take your time. You know, we can take some time here, but I would love for you to tell me how does that look like to finish this last year with dignity? So he takes his time and then he talks and says, well, it would be me having shoes that are good shoes, a uniform, uh, having all my books and having the, um, the monthly payments of the school being paid for and not having to be kicked out of class because my mom could, wasn't able to pay. Awesome. Okay. Let's say, let's say we're able to meet all those needs. Okay. Would it be fair? And here is again the intentionality of let's do this together. It's not me telling you what to do. Let's do this together. Would it be fair if we're able to meet that? Would it be fair for me to tell you that in return, the only thing that we would ask you is that you get good grades. How does that sound to you, right? And he looks at me and he pauses and he says, yeah, that's fair. Okay, so deal, deal, right? We provide you that. And then the only thing that we ask you is that you do your best. And by doing your best, the result, usually the result is you will get good grades, right? And if something along the way happens that doesn't allow you to get good grades, then we talk about it, right? He says, yes. And so he's, as you know, this, this school year is going to end in a few months. Um, he's a straight A student. He's a straight A student. And I meet with him once a month, kind of like a mentoring thing. And we're talking about, I'm asking him, what do you want to do after this, right? And can't promise yet that we're going to be able to afford it. But I want to know. I want him to think. And he says to me, well, I want to go to the, I want to go to university. But at first, I want to start something, you uh, study something technical so I can start working and then university, right? So, yeah, what do you want to study? Well, maybe graphic design, I'm not sure. But then the desire is there, right? And we're cultivating that and letting him talk and letting him manifest that. So other conversations are going to come, but yeah, that's the goal of the organization, right? Because to us, how we see it, he's the one, I think he's going to continue with his education. We will do our best to help him with that. But I believe that he's the one who's going to help his family break the cycle of poverty. And we're going to try to stay with him until he is completely finished with everything, right? 
So that's what we want. And this is the conversation that happened as an organization too, because some people in the organization were saying, you know, but we just paid for high school. So good, we're done. We can continue with somebody else, right? No, we're not done. We're done when he finishes his career. We're done when he's able to say, I am the one paying for my sisters who is very little. I'm the one who's gonna be able to help her pay for her career. That's when we're done. When the cycle of poverty changes, okay? And we're all very open to hear each other, right? Push back, but we're always open to hear. And that's that. I think that's to to answer your question in a shorter way. It's constant communication, constant communication. And I always have this mantra with them. I tell them, just remember this. And I want you. And I'm gonna repeat it to you every time. And you're gonna get tired of me. We are going to disagree. Conflict is gonna happen. That's part of being in relationship. Yet the difference between a healthy relationship and an unhealthy relationship is when a healthy relationship conflict happens, we take a break, we might get mad, but then we come back and we sit down again. And that's what's going to happen. And I don't mind conflict as long as we don't walk away. So we, I always repeat that mantra and I'm hoping that it's getting, you know, because we get into sometimes but when we come together and we resolve it. So... That is a beautiful story, and it just goes to show that sometimes our own thinking, our own way of um, seeing how we can help is can be limiting, which is then limiting someone else's life and potential. And so I love that you took the time and intention to think about the bigger picture of like breaking that generational cycle of poverty for one family, because it just takes like one person to be able to like shift a whole trajectory for themselves and their families. And like, I, I think of like in my, like I'm being challenged now, like in my Western way of thinking like you just think in like very um like in a box so like even just thinking about about schooling like you finish uh elementary and then it's like okay once you're done with eighth grade like then what are you gonna do and then it's another box then you're in high school for four years and then it's like okay well you're done with that you're on your own go to college and then that's another box where we we think that it's like less of a touch point or like hands on, like, okay, well, they're done with high school. So they might as they, they of course know what they're going to do and we don't have to like worry about it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like even in those college years, like there is still like a lot of forming that can be done in someone's like brain development in their own personal understanding of themselves. I think about when I was in college and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, how is it that I'm on my own, like figuring out life? And um, yeah, so I love that you are thinking about just beyond the, the chunk of high school. Okay, that person's done. Like, on to the next. And I think a lot of times, like, that's how we think. Like, okay, one thing is done, check, on to the next. Like, we don't have to think about that anymore. Yeah. But when we think about the big picture and are intentional about, like, the end goal, uh -huh. that's when we can take time to pause and actually pour into an individual and not just, it's not just, like, a checklist of, like, okay, done with that, done with that, done with that, next. Yes. And... I love that piece about how you're intentional about the humanity of who you're helping and serving and partnering with and how that's going to impact the community as a whole when you're intentional about that. It might take a lot longer and a lot more resources, but the impact is going to be that much greater. I know. So I'm I really can see it. Yeah. I'm get to see it but it's it's happening yes and so i just love that you share from that perspective because i think that's a lesson that we can take from it because a lot of times like in the u.s like that's just how we're taught to think like it's a checklist and then you're just on to the next and what's next mm -hmm. and um 
I think there's a that cultural piece of like just slowing down and thinking about things and thinking about uh, the the lasting effect because I mm-hmm. I know we've talked a lot about cultural legacy yeah. and a legacy is not just like one individual it like ties generations that came before us and the generations that will come after us. hundred percent. And so I would love to ask, what are some challenges that you have seen, whether that's in your for-profit business or nonprofit business that you didn't necessarily expect to experience, mm-hmm. but they, they showed up, they popped up and how have you navigated through those yeah. challenges? Yeah. It's been very, um, luckily, no challenge has been uh, hard to get through, but there has been quite a few. But let me say this before I talk about the challenges. I think that the reason why I'm able to face the challenges is because even before I started my business and non-for-profit, I made sure that I had a group of mentors and a group of people who kept me accountable. So, because there is a fear that I have, and I never want to lose this fear, the fear that I have that it will become about money or I will lose my way. So if I only do it myself and only with my head and my thoughts, the possibilities of me losing my way increases. So the the group that I have, they keep me on check and I'm able to go to them and say, here is what I'm thinking, here is what's happening. And I'm able to receive, no, you're wrong. Oh no, you're right. Or lean more into this, lean more into that, right? When it comes to challenges, uh, let me see. I think the challenge has been to uh, be able to create something different and unique when it comes to the for-profit, right? Because for-profits, even when I was looking into uh, how to create my Cardenas Institute, uh, most, if not all, because I'm sure I didn't research everything, but most, if not all, were very cookie cutter. And I wanted to create something that wasn't cookie cutter yet being able to create profit. So it's kind of like when I ask people, hey, how can I create something that is not cookie cutter, what I still support, but I still make more, I still make money, right? They look at me like, well, no, (laughs) you can't, right? But the reason why I say that is because it was very challenging to find this balance, but I was determined to find this balance, which is Cardenas provides services uh, for people, therapy services, And uh, we do it with people who have insurance, right? But, and my commitment was, how do I give services to people who can only pay maybe $5, $10, $20? And we made it. There are people uh, we have with me, there are three therapists who work here. And each of the therapists has two people that they see that they can only pay, they only pay between $10 to $20 per session. That was my mission. That was my goal. It couldn't be only about money because I would lose my way. So we have people like the new, we have a couple of people, we call them the new arrivals or the arrivals that come here. And the question that I ask them is, I ask them, how much can you pay? And they're very honest. They are like, you know, I can, I can afford this $10, right? And the beautiful thing that I have seen happen in Karina is that after a while, either they come to us, they come to us and they say, hey, I got a job. And I can pay a little more. That to me, like, makes me want to tear up, right? Because it's not only the connection, the humanity, but it's also, I see, I see that you guys are trying, right? So that was a, a huge challenge and trying to push towards the, the people who would say that, w- that won't work, that won't work, right? Pushing through that. The other one has been more to me, more like uh, logistics, kind of like learning uh, how to manage uh, insurance programs and things like that that can be very challenging because I've never actually had my own business, right? So I took a lot of time reading and researching and talking to people about that. Um, When it comes to uh, clients or people that I see, there hasn't been anything major or unexpected that that was hard to handle. Now, the other part that was a challenge for me, and I think I I mentioned it to you uh, at some point, is that I'm switching more... I'm doing therapy, yet what I what I have found it is an institute. So part of being an institute, we do also teaching, right? Teaching and helping other clinicians develop their skills. So I'm leaning more towards that part. 
yet the intention of leaning more on towards that part is because if I lean more towards that part, we are able to provide maybe more services for people who can afford. And then some of that money also goes to for equal opportunities. So it's the challenge also to uh, reclaim a space and say, hey, I'm here, right? That was a challenge too, to sit at the table and say, I feel in such a discomfort right now at this table, but I'm going to sit because I've earned my place and I'm going to sit down and make my business be known. So I hope that answered your question. I feel like I went everywhere with that. <laughs> yeah, I think that I just like to ask the question because a lot of times we don't necessarily talk about the challenges in a very raw and real way, but it's so important for people to feel seen and know that they're not the only ones facing challenges and challenges come in all shapes and sizes. Like they can be mental blocks that we have really had to work towards in order to get us to the next step. Or it could be financial challenges and navigating, like you said, wanting to be equitable and provide services to people who cannot afford the full price, but also providing services to people who, can, who have insurance and can use that to pay for their services. So it is a lot of um, navigating different challenges, whether that's in the the tangible way that we can see like challenges, like I think of like, okay, well, there's a lot of mental challenges that are going on through my head as I navigate traffic. And then there's also the traffic piece that everyone can see and everyone's navigating together. And so I think that, yeah, I just like to bring that to the conversation so that people can feel that they're not alone in the challenges that they're facing, whether that's in their for-profit business, in their personal life, in their in the corporate world, in the nonprofit space. Challenges are going to arise, but it's how we show up and um, think through them in partnership with the people that around us that we trust. I also like the fact that you mention mentorship because I think it's so important for everyone to have mentors in their lives. Like even the mentors need mentors around them. And so um, if someone is wanting to uh, look for a mentor or they, they feel like they could benefit from someone like helping them out, helping them think through the next step in their lives, like where do you think that would be beneficial for them to start that process? Like if they've never had a mentor before. Sure. So, um, you know, I look back at my, my experience working in different places and also the friendships that I've had and people who I respect when I work with them or either when I saw their work. And for example, a, a former supervisor that I had years ago, I was intentional in reconnecting with him. Very smart person, very smart, very sharp. And I, I develop like, I, I've heard you say using this line too, and I, I do this too. My first uh, reconnecting with him was like, will you be open for a cup to get together for a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> so we got together for a cup of coffee and then I was, we started the conversation and um, I asked him, would it be okay if I invite you again, you know? And he was very, very open to do that, right? Um, and also, from the from before when I met him when I knew him he knew that I had I had respect for his opinion right so that was that's the way that I've done even with professors uh, professors that I've had way in the past you know way in the past I have been able to reach out and say even it be an email or phone do you remember me wondering I'm not saying that everybody says yes but what's the worst that could happen if you try that they say no and then you move on and you try the next one right. And from all the attempts that I have made, I mean, four showed up and I made a lot of attempts with a lot of people, right? But not only a mentorship where they specifically know that they are mentors to me, I'm very intentional in observing how people handle themselves, whether they, when they have a business or whether they are interacting in friendship or spiritually, I'm very observant and I, because I like to learn. There is something that the person next to me has that I don't. 
And when I observe, when I listen, I can learn. And I like that. So when I interact with people, um, even with friends, friends that I love dearly, I'm very intentional in hearing how they do life. Because there is something that I'm going to get out of that that I can apply in my in my own life or business, right? Um, that I would suggest that. Go back to the people when you think about that. Go back to the people that you have now or maybe you had at some point that you respected their, their professional attitude. You respected the way they handle themselves in life, the way they handle themselves in friendship, and try to spend more time with them. Even if it doesn't become an official mentorship, just spending time with them, it gives you, it helps you to have a better perspective or a bigger perspective, right? That would be one. And then let me let me go back to your previous questions about the challenge because I remember too, you see, I was trying to put away in my bag. I didn't want to talk about it. Um, this is a challenge that is still continuous with me, which is balancing my hours. I feel like I want to work all the time. And I know that I need, and then I know I need to keep a better balance with that. And I've had my loved ones telling me, it's time to close your computer. <laughs> Right. So I'm, I'm working really hard. This is an ongoing work. Yet I do know that there are little things that I could do to increase that time. And I want to I want to. I'm very open to do that, to doing that. But it's 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 very challenging. And then the other challenge that I had and I, I had when we were when I was starting my business, the money wasn't uh, consistent. Right. So I had to place different hats. And for example, I will have a session and in between sessions, I was cleaning the whole space. And, you know, it's beautiful, but it's exhausting, right? But I'm cleaning and everything and then going back and then putting my hat of being the person who um, checks with insurance and putting my hat of the person who gets the phone calls and get the new gets, gets the clients in. So all of that and putting my hat of reaching out to people and making connections, that's exhausting. So that's very challenging when you when you do that. Now, what I would say is that that's basically when you start a business, that's basically what your life is going to be like for at least the first two years. It's going to be like that. Um, I would say that after two years, I step back on the cleaning because I have somebody who helps me with that. Right. But for two years, I was cleaning and it was taking me time. So little things like that were very challenging. Yeah, I love that you share vulnerably about those challenges and even mentorship. I think a lot of us, and that's why I raise the question, a lot of us might think a mentor is like someone that you're intentionally like, will you be my mentor? But it really is just like who you're spending your time with. It's, it's, it could be like, a few of your closest entrepreneur friends or business friends or nonprofit friends that you just get together and talk about life and pour into each other and elevate each other, push each other, challenge each other, that could be mentorship. And so I think it's, it's the piece that is important is putting yourself out there first. And so, yeah, I love that you share that. I would love to share where people can connect with you and how they can like tap into what you're doing, how they can help, how they can find what is next for uh, what you're doing with your business and your nonprofit. That's awesome. So for my business, for the For Profit Cardenas Institute, you know, you can find me, you can give us a call 773-663-2989 uh, if you want to make an appointment for therapy or also if you want to schedule um you know, for me to do a workshop, I do different kinds of workshop and speaking events. Um, and also website, cardenasinstitute.com. I'm also on LinkedIn, Rita Romero, Cardenas Institute, and it'll pop up, or Rita Romero for Equal Opportunities, and it'll pop up. Um, that what's coming up for Cardenas is to engage more in the uh, speaking engagements. We want to make it more known. And because the, the, my goal, one of my goals with Cardenas is to uh, help clinicians be clinicians of the world, terapeutas del mundo. Porque la forma, the, the, the way that we see therapy needs to, needs to adapt to the changes that we're having. And we are super connected. The whole world is connected. So we need to be therapists of the world. And that takes a lot of work. So 
when it comes to the for-profit, we're actually having a very small event. It's, it's very, very small event, but we're having a very small event soon too uh, with donors and potential donors because our goal is to start getting seed money to buy a land in the neighborhood. We want my goal, our goal is to have in the future a community center there, a community center where it's going to start the starting is going to be having just space where the kids can go do their homework with dignity, meaning having a nice chair, nice desk, and a nice bathroom where they can just do homework with dignity. And it will develop into other things, but that's the beginning, right? And we also want to be able to support the community to create or um, they, they, have they have told us that they would like this. They would like to see a park because a park here, you know, in this country, you see parks left and right. Some better care for than others, but you see parks. In that community, there are zero parks for kids to play. So that would be something out of their own request that we would like to work towards. Oh, that's beautiful and so exciting. As we wrap up and close the episode, what is one piece of advice that you would give to the next generation? Can I give two? Yes. <laughs> okay, the first one is pay forward pay forward. Um, when you when you get to the point where you have resources, privileges, and things like that, you got to pay forward. This is how the chain grows. That's one. The other thing is when you're starting your journey and it, it is your desire to uh, change generational cycles, you got to keep going. And keep going means that sometimes you're going to have to leave your family behind because they are not they are not willing or they cannot, they don't have the capacity to follow you. It's gonna be super painful as an immigrant myself, first generation, I met a lot of first generations, super painful. But remember this, by you moving forward, that doesn't mean that you forget them. You get where you, you, get where you wanna go, you get there and then you go back for them. And then you bring them back where they, you are right now. You need to do that. That's how we also change generational cycles. That doesn't mean that you forget that. That doesn't mean that you are saying no to my family. You are saying, hey, if we need to, if we want to change this cycle, I need to get there. Can you follow me? No, it's too much. No, there is too much in my mind. No, I don't have the capacity to do that. That's okay. I'll continue. I'll come back for you later. And make sure you come back. That would be the two people, the two pieces that that I would, you know, that would be my advice and so also something that I live by in my own personal and professional life. Pay forward. Mm, this episode is so good. This conversation has been amazing. I really appreciate your heart, your thoughtfulness, your intention, and just your example. I I really appreciate you. And so I thank you for coming on. Thank you. It's mutual. That respect and that appreciation is mutual. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, we will talk soon and hopefully we can connect and collaborate again in the future. Oh, that for sure. Yes, <laughs> for sure. All right. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Rita really is challenging our ways of thinking and how we partner with our communities, which is amazing. I really appreciate her cultural awareness. Okay, amigos, thank you so much for listening. There will be a new episode every Tuesday, so after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot to post on Instagram and tag at Elevating La Cultura or send me a DM. You can also comment on our YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue Elevating La Cultura. All right, enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening, y nos vemos next week. Bye.